Hello and welcome to the introductory video for section 2.5. In this video, we will combine limit laws from section 2.3 and a few small theorems to obtain four common limit calculation techniques. It is not 100% correct to refer to all of these as techniques. However, the order in which these are listed is very important. Direct substitution is a theorem used so often that you usually won't be aware you're using it. Simplification and conjugation are previously acquired skills that you should hone and be conscious of. And the squeeze theorem is rarely used, but it can surprise you in its applications. If a function is continuous at a, then the limit as x approaches a can be evaluated by directly substituting a for x. Direct substitution uses the fact that a function is continuous whenever the limit and the actual value are equal. Therefore, the limit can be evaluated by finding the actual value by replacing x with a. Recall from section 2.4 that the common functions are continuous on values in their domain. Let's take an example. What happens if we're trying to find the limit as x approaches 2? Well, if you look in the denominator, x minus 2 appears. That means that 2 is not in the domain of our function. Plugging in 2 for x gets 0 in the denominator, which is not defined. This is where simplification comes into play. We cannot calculate this limit using direct substitution, as the function is undefined at x equals 2. So how can we calculate the limit? First notice that this function is not simplified. We can factor the numerator by first pulling out an x, then factoring a difference of squares. And then we can cancel x minus 2 from the top and the bottom, and we are left with the polynomial x times x plus 2. Notice that this is not a correct expression. The equal sign is improperly used. The right-hand side is defined at x equals 2. If we plug in 2, we get out 8. While the left-hand side is undefined at x equals 2. If we plug in 2, we're dividing by 0, which doesn't equal 8. It's not a number. To correct for this error, it is important to write that x cannot be 2 in order for this equality to hold. The natural question to ask is what is the connection between the limit of the original function and the limit of the polynomial x times x plus 2? It turns out that they are equal. Notice that the rational function and the polynomial are equal everywhere but 2. Therefore, their limits, their trends, as x approaches 2, are the same. With our ant visualization from section 2.2, it is easy to see why this theorem is true. We take the graph of f and g with f colored blue and g colored in red, and the points in common colored purple. Notice that the points near a are all purple. That means that f and g are the same all around a. The left-hand limit as x approaches a, the location left of the ant crawls towards, will be the same for both f and g as both are represented by the purple line. And the right-hand limit as x approaches a, the direction right of the ant crawls, will also be the same for both f and g. Therefore, the limit of f and g will be equal if they exist. Lucky for us, the function x times x plus 2 is a polynomial and continuous everywhere. You were probably first exposed to our third technique, conjugation, when you learned how to rationalize the denominator. A conjugate of the expression x plus y is x minus y. They are the twins in the factorization of the difference of squares, x squared minus y squared. Conjugation will prove useful in circumstances where having all elements squared will be useful. In particular, conjugation will prove useful when dealing with square roots. We will tack this limit by multiplying the conjugate of the numerator. What is the conjugate of the numerator? Well, we find the conjugate by flipping the middle sign, and we multiply by the conjugate over the conjugate, the same as 1, algebraically, when we multiply by conjugate over conjugate. Algebraically, we have changed nothing. We use the conjugate property in the numerator. Remember, the conjugates form a twin to the factorization of the difference of squares. we leave the denominator undisturbed because the square and the square root cancel each other out. We are left with 7 plus h minus 7. Cleaning up the numerator with arithmetic, we are left with h in the numerator and h in the denominator, which we cancel. 
Now notice that the limit of the denominator is non-zero. This means that we are in a position to use our limit laws from section 2.3. We use the quotient rule, moving the limit into the numerator and the denominator. After using direct substitution with h equals zero, we find that the limit is one over two times the square root of seven. It may have slipped by you, but we make use of simplification between the yellow step and the green step. The yellow function is not defined at h equals zero because h is in the denominator, while the green function is defined at h equals zero. The reason why the limits are equal is the simplification theorem from a few minutes ago. Our final technique is known by many names. We will call it the squeeze theorem, but it can also be called the sandwich theorem or the pinch theorem. The squeeze theorem is the consequence of the observation that if one function g, colored in red, is larger than the function f, colored in black, that the limit of g is larger than the limit of f as x approaches a, provided the limit exists, of course. The squeeze theorem takes this observation and doubles it up with the squeeze in the middle. That is, there are three functions, h on top of g on top of f, and the limit of f and h are equal as x approaches a. This then pinches the limit of the middle function g to the same limit as h and the same limit of f as x approaches a. Looking at this graph, you can understand how the squeeze theorem is sometimes described as two friends helping a drunk through a door. The squeeze theorem works best with functions that are easily bounded, such as sine and cosine. It will also make a special appearance in section 2.6. This graph actually depicts the squeeze theorem on x squared sine one over x as x approaches zero. As sine is a function naturally bounded by one and negative one, we can bound sine by one and negative one, multiply it by x squared, and suddenly the middle function is exactly the limit that we're interested in. What we have is three functions, x squared on top of x squared sine one over x on top of negative x squared. As x squared and negative x squared go to zero, as x approaches zero, the middle function is squeezed toward zero. Consider your toolbox for limit calculations to include these four techniques, as well as the limit laws from section 2.3. You've seen the basics. Now work towards mastery through practice and study.